there's fears of those sort of things happening. Um, and I have heard of people having a like, certain black mirror type uh, experiences with machine learning models recently. Really? Yes. <laughs> So Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. And so the first thing I kind of had on my mind was you're building Banana. This is true. To write to to kind of read it off the website, Banana is scalable inference yeah. hosting for your machine learning models on serverless GPUs. Yes, lots of buzzwords. So why the name Banana? There's a lot of reasons on this one. Firstly, we like to say we're the next Apple. So the other reason is. If you're on Reddit, are you on Reddit at all? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. So you, if you if you know the Reddit memes, the common Reddit memes, uh, banana for scale. It's it's common on Reddit when you take photos of something and you need to show the size or the scale of it. You just like put a banana next to it. The original oh, photo is like yeah, okay. someone was selling their TV and they just like <laughs> taped a banana to yeah, it and yeah, said yeah. banana I, for scale. I, I know what he's talking about. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't. So um, I decided to go off of that because, you know, when you're running production workloads, you want you want scale, you want something you can trust. So use banana for scale. Huh. That's actually genius. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I would not have thought that answer was that complex. Yeah. No. It's really good. And we hide it throughout our, our marketing copy. And occasionally customers will DM us like, hey, this is awesome. Like I, I caught what you did there. Uh, it's really good. Oh, love it. That's, that's honestly really, yeah. really cool. Yeah. So is your background, obviously it's technical because of the product you're building, but yes. where does the marketing and like growth side come? Is that you? Is that someone else on the team? Uh, it's myself and one other person on the team, uh, Blake, the marketing guy. Uh, we, we work together to put out content and um, I mean, I honestly, I just tweet a lot as well. And uh, that's been awfully helpful for us from a marketing lens. Uh, so I, I do go into that ter territory. I think it's just because I like enjoy nerding out about this sort of stuff and mm. uh, tend to be decently good at thinking on my toes. So uh, it's made it so that I could uh, talk about th these sort of things, riff on them uh, without much issue. And it's been a good tool for us. But when it comes to like cranking out content, uh, getting blogs out, we uh, that's between myself and another person on the team. Awesome. And so is that other person Blake? Blake. Yes. Okay. So there's you, Our Blake. Blake. Uh, I briefly spoke with Kyle. So he's the yeah. other co-founder. Yeah. Kyle's my co-founder. We have Sahil, another engineer, and okay. Candace, who works on operations. Okay. So team of five. And you're not based in San Francisco, are you? I I tell people I am when it's convenient. Like okay. If I'm fundraising and you know, want to get those SF valuations. Of course. It's a like, company's based in San Francisco. And we are spiritually. Um, I, ever since COVID hit, I've lived in Mexico City. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but I'll be back here full time in the new year. Before COVID, were you also still here? I was here. Yep. Interesting. So what was the, the reason for, for moving to, to Mexico City? I was poor, mainly. <laughs> I, um, I was... Uh, I'd call it bootstrapping, uh, very, very minimum funding uh, for startups and living in San Francisco. Uh, got pretty far into debt doing that. Not something I'd recommend anyone do. Um, but it was just writing on credit card debt and just being laid on rent. And when COVID hit, I'm like, I have no reason at all to be spending this sort of money living here when things are shut down. So mm. um, managed to get an investor check and just bail out of the situation. And I had... It, it was like 30K or 25K, uh, and I had to stretch that as long as humanely possible. So looked around the world for, you know, what cities in the world are there for uh, cheap living, you know, relatively similar time zone, um, nice people, decent safety, decent Wi-Fi, and ended up in Mexico City. And wow. how long did you make that 25K, 30K stretch? It would have been more than six months. And it was just you? Yeah, it was just me. Uh, stretch that for six months along the way. Actually, got involved with Founders Inc. Um, we did the the pitch events, so I won some crypto through the the weekly ship it events. Interesting. Um, oh. And then that stretched me for another three months. So for at, three months, yeah, through through winning how the much crypto? Did, well, it was oh, like yeah, one yeah, Ethereum. I funded right? Banana through Efink winnings. No way. Wow. Yeah, I'm I'm the winningest Efink ship it member. What? Well, it's because I was desperate. I was in Mexico City and like trying to stretch money as far as I could. So uh, <laughs> I like had to win, you know? Okay. <laughs> let's Wait, talk. Let, let's, let's go into that. Yeah. So, okay. First off, how much did you get from effing for you to be able to make it stretched for, for three months? Um, I received in total about 3K worth of Ethereum, but this was during a pretty big, pretty big bull market. Okay. Uh, so 
I held on to that for uh, a bit of time while I was still running on the uh, like the cold hard cash. And by the time I needed to dip into it, it is in like the 10k range. Wow, that's insane. Oh, so that makes sense. How it was a few months of running. Yeah. Run. What okay. did your let, let's talk lifestyle, right? When you were in that like period of time where you're stretching out the money, what did your life look like? There definitely wasn't no. a blue bottle uh, in your life anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, thankfully, Mexico City actually treated me pretty well. Um, I feel like my time living in San Francisco being uh, quite a bit poorer uh, was. The, the lowest point in terms of like lifestyle, I was eating rice and beans and sleeping in bunk beds in order to like squeeze through on the money I had. Um, but yeah, in Mexico City, it's like you could go out to the street and uh, grab a, a full meal of tacos for like two dollars. Mm. So um, I, I, I was balling pretty well. It was, it was a good time. That's nice. And did you have friends living with you? Were people from the team in Mexico City with you? Initially, no. Uh, well, I was a solo team to start. Uh, so I just like yellowed my way down there with a backpack and didn't really know anyone. Um, and then over time, I was able to convince some friends. Uh, in fact, some friends here from Effing uh, convinced them to come down and live with oh, me. Wow. Um, so we, we, we got a little bit of a founder house going down there for about a year in like 2021. What did that conversation look like? If you're, if you're trying to convince me to now move down to Mexico City, obviously, you know, yeah. COVID's not there anymore. So it's not the same conversation. But mm -hmm. what did it look like when you were convincing them? It was pretty easy. I, basically, I was, I was living the life I was living. Uh, they could tell that I was, I was happy. I was comfortable. Way more comfortable than I'd be in San Francisco. They were also experiencing COVID. So, of course, like they're considering these things. Um, so they made the decision to, um, just go international anyway. And I'm like, yeah, Mexico city is definitely the place to be like, you guys should be here. Um, so and while you were there by yourself in the beginning, did you make friends that were local? I, I met my girlfriend. Okay. What yeah. was that? This, what was the story behind that? Um, well, I don't know what I could say on the record. Okay. Uh, cause you know, traditional Mexican family. Okay. Um, okay. But we, we met online and uh pretty quickly quick kicked it off we we both had intentions of uh being in a long-term relationship and still are we're two years in congrats uh, awesome that's one of the main reasons i've been hanging out down there uh the majority of my time is she gonna come up to to sf yeah, with she you is. Yeah, nice. we're gonna get her up here she's learning front end right now so she's gonna be a tech bro <laughs> That's, nice. the, that's the only way to do it, right? Yeah. yeah. And so your co-founder wasn't with you in the beginning, no. uh, Kyle. Yeah, a bit of a st spicy story here, actually. Okay, let's get into it. Um, so Kyle was one of the founders that, um, that moved down to Mexico. So we ended up being roommates. Uh, him and his co-founder at the time, also named Eric, uh, were working together on their respective startups. So we're all growing. We actually, we both launched on Product Hunt on the same day. So we had just good vibes all around of like, going through a lot of the same ebbs and flows together as a company who ranked higher on product hunt oh they crushed me they destroyed oh. me <laughs> uh, they they ended up getting product of the year wow, wow. what was the that. product uh audio read so or audio this, blogs at the time is yeah. this what turned into unreal speech this is correct gotcha, uh, gotcha. so it was their um basically a chrome extension that converted the text on the screen into a podcast that you would then listen to so huh. um yeah that popped off really well for them so needless to say my co-founder Kyle was very busy with that for a while, despite me continuously nudging him and yeah. trying to steal him away. Um, he, he he was working on that for a good year in Mexico City. Interesting. Oh, and then and then I stole him, and he stole him. Yeah. What was that conversation like? I think uh, he and his co-founder were uh, individually deciding what they wanted to do. Um, they were they were growing Audi blogs uh, now Audio Read later on Real Speech. Um, they were growing that and they felt like they had, uh, hit a point where, um, they needed to make some decisions on their own lives on like, if they wanted to continue doing this, they ultimately decided to split up. Mm. Um, and I was, you know, sort of helping them through the logistics of like, you know, who gets what part of the company, who continues on the legacy, things like that. And I knew like in the back of my head the whole time, I'm like, oh, I'm getting any proposition Kyle. Like he's definitely... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's feeling sad to like leave the startup. Um, but I got a comfy new home for him and I sprung that. I pulled them both aside. I'm like, I'm offering Kyle to be my co-founder right now. And they were both like, this is great. This is a good outcome. And how much, how much traction did you have at that time? Oh, um, we had a lot. Yeah. Um, oh, you had traction. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point I had raised a pre-seed already. Um, I had grown our revenue pretty significantly. I ended up, uh, getting up to like a half million dollar annual oh. revenue. Solo. Wow. 
Okay. So, all by yourself. Uh, yeah, I had um, I had one person jump on Jacob here. Actually, uh, Jacob helped out for a period of time. Nice. Um, we grew that a decent amount. Um, ended up raising a seed round uh, off of that. That was for a previous product, a previous pivot. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, yeah, basically had a a a happy and well funded home for Kyle to jump to. And so while you were helping them decide what to do with the company. They're both your friends. They're mm-hmm. both also, I guess, friends with each other because they're mm-hmm. co-founders. Mm-hmm. At what point in your mind do you kind of think about when to leave a startup? That's a hard one. Because um, I feel like, well, this is actually, this is a, a close to home one because this is what I've been uh, living the last few months of, not myself considering leaving a startup where we're popping off and having a great time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm trying to recruit all of my friends, man. Um, I am, you're watching everyone around you go through their various, uh, like startup journeys and trying to figure out, you know, I, I timed it perfectly with getting Kyle, uh, and it, Kyle's far and out one of the best people on our team. Um, so it's like, I want to hire founders. I want to hire people who have been in the trenches before and are doing that sort of stuff, uh, and know what it's like. So. I generally am keeping tabs on people, and uh, especially as we've been growing a lot the last few months with Banana, uh, being a bit more politely assertive to other people around me, the, the startup founders I respect of like, hey, yeah, we have a place for you on our team. You should uh, yeah, come on, join us. And so, okay, so Banana, you're trying to essentially build into the next Apple. Like there's yeah. some, some motivation behind the name. What does it look like, or what does Banana look like in five, 10 years when it's like, you know, unicorn, you know, big company? Yeah. What does that vision look like? Um, well, we want to be sort of like the quiet underpinning to software as you know it. Uh, AWS? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'd pitch it, I'd spin it more as Vercel in that uh, we want that ease of use. We want creators, people who are building and shipping as fast as possible to choose using Banana. Um, so, you know, that's the brand we uh, aim to have within two years is, you know, the more hobbyists, early startups. And then as we expand, we could start getting into larger markets and larger businesses. But in the end, like we, we believe in software 2.0, if you're familiar. Tell me. Yeah. It's the, the idea that, you know, software 1.0, you have hard coded software, you have logical for loops, things like that. Software 2.0 is the idea that, you know, the software of our world is going to be increasingly replaced by machine learning models. Mm. So under this premise, we need an infrastructure provider. So I want Banana to be that. How far away do you think we are from that? Uh, we're we're being building scale. We're building this now for that to happen in ten years. Okay. I think um, we'll start seeing the vast majority of like broadly accepted, even consumer applications within the next five years have some you know ML forward components. Yeah, things like you know Sable Diffusion came out, the text to image generator. Uh, things like Figma plugins or even full creative suites built around these sort of things as like the core. Um, Diagram is huge. If that's like one of the things you're thinking about with Figma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's like more AI forward, ML forward. Mm. When it comes to like actually replacing functions themselves, uh, there's always going to be pl- a place for some functions. Um, but as we get closer and closer to 10 years from now, I think because of the fact that we have what I'll call flagship models, like the big workhorse models, like the large language models, GPT-3, or something like a stable diffusion. Those are essentially the centerpiece of the product. And you don't really realize it from the outside, but the software that's interfacing with those has, is like, it's sort of like a Venn diagram between like hard-coded software and machine learning where you're, you know, preparing, preparing the tensors to be uh, put through the model. Uh, or you're doing operations in latent space and it becomes a lot less hard-coded and logical Mm. and a bit more like fuzzy in the way it behaves. Um, So I think within 10 years, we may start hitting the point where a majority of the software we we write, at least, uh, will be that fuzzy layer between like the hard-coded software that was previously written and like the frameworks we're being built on, which are still running hard-coded software. But like the majority of the legwork from a software engineering stance and the new code that's going to be written um, is likely going to be this interface between the models themselves, the workhorse models, and whatever framework you may be running it in. Mm. I'm going to ask a very basic kind of dystopian question. Yeah. So let's say, you know, we get to a point where, however far away it is, we get to a point where AIs are, let's just say sentient, right? Yep. 
do you, what are your thoughts on, you know, the problem statement of, you know, now they get so smart that they change their own code and then take over the world? I was waiting for you to put that in there. Yeah. I get this question a lot when I try to explain to my parents what I do. Um, <laughs> so there, there is, um, I think there's, there's fears of those sort of things happening. Um, and I have heard of people having like certain black mirror type uh, experiences with machine learning models recently. Really? Yes. Uh, I'm not much of a believer in sentience being anytime soon. Uh, I'm not going to put a timeline to it. I haven't been in the space or in, I haven't been in the AGI space enough. Uh, but with the sort of stuff we see at Banana, it's generally, it's more transactional. It's like the model is good at one thing and one thing over only, not necessarily multimodal. You mentioned AGI. Um, yeah. That stands for artificial general intelligence? Yes, good question. Artificial general intelligence, the idea that an ML model itself could have a sentience, a conscience, um, can think for itself. And these are the AIs that people think of when you think about uh, the event or like the explosion of AIs essentially getting so smart that they run away from us. Um, Talking about iRobot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, iRobot, Terminator, that sort of Terminator. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Skynet. Um, I think that's going to be pretty far in the future. I imagine it happening, though I do know ultimately, you know, being in the physical world, uh, we can set up the necessary hard stops on these sort of things mm. uh, to make it so that we we have them as companions and assistants. Um, and I think the amount of uh, literally just hardware integrations that you need to do in order for a runaway AI to actually, you know, cause detrimental effects in our world would yeah. be pretty large. Um, like it could be smart. It could be, you know, almost even sentient, but the ability, it doesn't have hands is the best way to put it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's going to be hard for it to like reach out and to start tweaking those sort of things. Though there have been like sort of freaky examples of like AIs writing code. Um, for me, that's the most like meta level or closest to that, where if you have it write code and then execute that code, that's where you could start getting into a runaway problem because you've given it hands. What, I mean, you mentioned earlier, there are some like Black Mirror like style stories. Mm -hmm. What are some of the stories you've heard? The one I'll talk about is mainly just a researcher who's been working with uh, these text, -to I believe it was a text-to-speech model. Um, and it was very much, uh, do you know the Turing test? Are you familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Turing test, for those who don't know, is um, is the AI good enough to confuse you or convince you that it's an actual human? Um, and I think we've started seeing uh, models of that level where you're talking to it um, either through like a text interface or, you know, text to speech or speech to text. You're essentially conversing with the thing or interacting with it. And the responses that it has contain so much nuance that you wouldn't expect to be baked into the model. So in the case of uh, this model itself, I think the data it was trained on uh, contained something that was thematically very recent. Um, and they had asked a question to it in regards to like something that they thought was completely out of the context that the model had. And it, you know, spat out something relevant. Um, so situations like that, um, I think it ends up being, we, we end up forgetting that the re the the things that these models are trained to do is to emulate humans in the best possible way, especially large language models. They're built on a corpus of human textual data. So of course, you're going to hit a point in accuracy where it feels like a human is writing it because everything it learned from was written by a human at one point. So I guess in the book Zero to One, I'm sure yeah. you've read it. So Peter Thiel talks about how in the early days of PayPal, um, they had to essentially build this algorithm to stop, like, to prevent against scammers. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then um, I bring this up because he's also reading the book right now. And and so w one of the things that happened was the scammers quickly figured out what the algorithms were, and then worked around them. Mm -hmm. But then they obviously couldn't have people manning, you know, like the the fraud detection because there were just too many transactions coming in. Yep. And the thing that worked was like a combination of both, you know, quote unquote, man and machine. Mm -hmm. So now they have the algorithms flagging things and yep. then real people behind it to, you know, like actually detect whether or not it's a real fraud. Mm -hmm. My question is, AI is a lot better now than it was back then. Yep. And arguably there are a lot of tasks that you can use AI to replace. Like, you know, we were just using copy.ai. Yeah. It's not the best, but it's definitely insane. Like what we were able to kind of come up with. Mm -hmm. 
what do you see when you think of like the economic problems or the economic like different like yeah, problems that will come from AIs, you know, replacing workers? Because that's been talked about a lot. I, I was I was actually leaning towards that question too. So yeah. I'm glad you got there. I assume you mean problems from like a negative sense of uh, people being out of work for exactly. a particular reason. Well, I'm also curious just yeah. just before before you get into that, even in terms of how you see banana dev growing in the types of jobs that you might see being obsolete. Mm-hmm. versus the skills like I, I i'm looking at it like web3 now yeah. like every every talented it seems like every talented developer is wants to work on a web3 project mm-hmm. and that requires a, a lot of technical savvy yeah but it's like so how do you kind of see the market where okay what are the skills needed to get to this version of software 2.0 and what skills that are maybe hot now yeah. uh, are, are going to be phased out see that's a I like that question because that allows me to give a positive spin on okay. your question. Okay. Oh, love, okay. it. Um, love it. Because generally people have the the doomer approach of like, okay, jobs are going to be automated. We're not going to have room for unskilled uh, laborers. They're yeah. just going to uh, get automated out. I think the skill floor is going to lower. I believe skill floor is the correct word. Essentially, okay. uh, the average person is going to be doing so many more skilled and educated tasks if they have... A companion AI that they could work with on the particular task. For example, I'm an awful artist. I could make pretty good art using Stable Diffusion. For example, can, can you? Yeah. Can, can we do a little bit on? I, I don't want to get too off, a, off topic, but I did want to about Stable Diffusion and just having a general yeah. discussion about it, and even even just explaining it to a lot of people who have probably heard the term, yeah, yeah but don't know specifically what it mm-hmm. is. So yeah. stable diffusion in 10 seconds, it's a text to image generative model. You describe, I want uh, a photo, a photorealistic painting of a unicorn dancing in a field. And you actually get that. Uh, it has added, added capabilities of image to image. So you could start with like a seed, maybe a terribly drawn version of a unicorn in a field. Yeah. And you say uh, a unicorn in a field in the style of Van Gogh and it would take like the shape or the outline you've created. Mm. Actually, you know the meme of like uh, step one, step two, step three, and then like oh, how yeah. to draw a horse. And yeah, then, yeah. Like, or draw step an one is like a scribble. Step yeah. two is like another scribble. And then step three is like a fully the fleshed whole out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the rest of the horse. Um, it actually is. It's going to be a lot like that. Is now you only need to get to step three where you've like outlined the horse to be yeah. an excellent horse illustrator. And that's mm. what you're saying will happen with AI in a positive sense. Yes, um, knowledge workers. You're not going to have to be as good at research in order to go find the information that you need because mm. you have models that you could instruct to prune through the internet and find the context that you're looking for. And by models, I mean it's like a glorified search engine. But it's all ultimately powered by these uh, interfaces, either voice or natural language like text, um, that's going to make the average person so much more powerful than they otherwise would be. I want to talk about voice, yeah. but before I get to that, what do you see being the negatives? I mean, as the CEO of like a ML API company, ML platform, uh, I, I think I would like to be 100% optimistic about these sort of things. Um, if I were to think about the things I'm a bit more worried about, it would be a loss of like the scientific approach with these sort of things. Mm. Um, I, I studied hard sciences, have a mechanical engineering degree. I was used to going through um, university, learning like here are a few fundamental rules about how things work. And then you could apply that, you could abstract that, or not abstract that, you could... Uh, generalize that across basically any problems that you come across. I think that as more and more of our tools become less logical and get more into this sort of fuzzy territory that I talked about before, yeah. where you it's a bit more of a black box interface, it's going to make the way we interact with the world and the way we interact with each other become more and more of like a humanities and social science problem, where we'd be approaching technical, the most technical things possible with something that works maybe 99% of the time because it has this fuzzy layer that you can't truly control. Uh, so I think there is going to be, it'd be, it'd be kind of like the AI is like a baby with superpowers and that like you could have it do a lot of things, but occasionally um, it may not be as accurate as you want it to be or it may, not, it may have some form of mistake. Um, so the things I'd be worried about would be us losing control, not in like a 
AI taking over the world sort of way. Um, but as we become more and more dependent on these tools, we it's sort of like a slippery slope. So do you now see a shift in education? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's like, why learn to write cursive when you could type on a keyboard now? Interesting. And so are you saying that might even turn into something like, why learn Python? Yeah, exactly. Why learn Python when you could just learn how to... Prompt engineer. Prompt engineer. I mean, mm. th this is the human, like the social science thing that I was talking about of like, it's no longer a hard science of like, you know, you initialize this variable and you flip the bits in this different way in order to like form your program. Now it's like you're interacting with something and saying, please, could I have this uh, mm -hmm. function? Um, and I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not being um, I'm not being a Luddite in any terms at all. I'm extremely excited for that. Uh, but I think education is going to change dramatically. Um, and the roles we play are going to be uh, like within work, uh, like the jobs we do are going to be less um, like cut and dry because the tools that we have allow us to flex into other areas. Interesting. That and we, so yeah. you were doing mechanical engineering. Yeah. Did you finish? I did. Yeah. Interesting. So you're uh, now out of our four episodes, two of our guests have finished. I know. I'm a total loser for finishing undergrad. That's it? I, no. Only, only two have finished? Yeah. Johnny didn't even go to college. And then oh, Abhishek yeah. uh, left Carnegie Mellon. I yeah. forgot the Johnny one. I totally f forgot that he, yeah. he didn't even, he barely finished high school. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. And and so I guess my question, I, I want to graduate, by the way. So I'm with you here. Yeah. But um, do you see the value of college also declining with this like shape, like with a shift in education? Um, I don't want to overfit to like the Silicon Valley ideals of dropout early. Um, having grown up in, I grew up on a farm. I went to school for mechanical engineering. Like I understand the environments in which it makes 100% sense to finish school and 0% sense to drop out and you're like a complete idiot. I think one of the few exceptions right now is when you're involved in tech um, and you could make your own way. You know, I taught myself how to code and got here. So that was cool. Um, I think as ML becomes more and more common, uh, we're going to see more and more of these career fields open up to non-formally college educated people. Because mm -hmm. um, right now, like, Technology. Why, why, why can people get in technology without a degree? It's like, well, they just learned how to use the tools. Mm. And if tools become better at doing vague things or like not scientific things, uh, for example, customer support or art or these sort of things, the, like I said before, the, the skill bar that is needed in order to perform those roles well uh, has been lowered. So uh, more and more people could do so without a credential. Yeah, I mean, in today's world, you can already become the CTO of like a consumer facing product mm -hmm. if your only knowledge is no code tools. Yep. And VCs will fund you if you have a good enough product to show them. Yep. That's really interesting. I guess one of the things like I, I'm now thinking about is product like prompt engineering, right? Mm -hmm. First off, could you explain kind of what prompt engineering is in a few seconds? Yes. Um, prompt engineering is essentially thinking in the way that the model thinks in order to get the most predictable response. So. Yeah. As an example, um, if you want a text generation model, which is essentially an autocomplete tool uh, to take in the text you give it and respond as if it's having a conversation with you, uh, you wouldn't want to just type, hello, how are you? Because in prompt engineering, you need to think, what was this model trained on in the first place? What examples has it seen that allows it to actually reply and you know, form a coherent conversation with you? And it was trained on text in the internet. It was trained on Reddit or um, all sorts of uh, textual information online. And when you see text online, it's like speaker A says, hello, how are you doing? And then speaker B replies X, Y, Z. Mm. Um, so prompt engineering is thinking about how the model or the format in which the model has like seen this information before to maximize the probability of it replying in a way that uh, is predictable. Uh, so if I wanted to have like a, you know, make GPT-3 reply to me and have a conversation with me, I wouldn't just be feeding it the things I'm telling it. I'd be feeding it the additional context of like, imagine you're in a room and there are two speakers and speaker one says, and then you template in what I say. And then speaker two replies with blank. By the nature of autocomplete, it's going to know that the continuation of that sentence is a reply. Gotcha. Mm. And then so... Back to like this, you were talking about how 
you know, the future of software, software yeah. 2.0. It's like now there's a fuzzy line between what is hard coded and yeah. what almost codes itself in a sense. Exactly. So would, wouldn't that mean that in five, 10 years, prompt engineering wouldn't exist because the natural language models would? A lot of people are arguing for that and a lot are arguing against. So um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a, a big war. Uh, it's an early enough topic where nobody has incredibly hard opinions on it. What, what are the two sides? Uh, I mean, one side is the idea that prompt engineering is just a crutch. It's like, it's like you're, you're building a chair and one of the legs is too short. So you just put a little shim underneath it and you're like, mm. it's good enough. But in, on like iteration two, you just build a chair the correct way. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, so the idea is like prompt engineer needing to think about interacting with models in the same way that you think about or thinking about the way you interact with models, uh, considering the way in which they've been trained. Uh, some argue that that's going to be increasingly obsolete. Um, and you can see examples of that, like with uh, OpenAI. Uh, they have a version of GPT-3 called Instruct. Um, and they've, I believe, I don't know how they implemented it, but I believe it's sort of that fuzzy layer around that I was talking about where they've essentially surrounded the model with an interpretation layer mm. uh, that allows people to just ask simple questions and not like, hey, go find the um, capital of Colorado mm. um, and not need to think about it in terms of prompt engineering because they have a layer that before they send it into the work, like the big workhorse model itself, they have some layer, some logic that transforms that into something that's more prompt engineered. Yeah. And then on the topic of open AI. Yeah. Well, I guess even to, to, to backtrack a little bit for the people that don't know what it is, can you explain GPT-3? Ah, yes. GPT-3. General Purpose Transformer, I believe is gpt um, and what is a transformer? Well, it's a type of architecture that essentially encodes memory and context. So uh, the reason GPT-3 has been such a strong, it's a text generation model. Um, so it auto-completes for you. You give it a segment of text and it continues that for you. The reason it's become so strong or so powerful and that we see so many companies in the last two years building on top of it as a central focus of their technology stack um, is for two reasons. One is an extremely large scale. I'm talking um, like in terms of gigabytes on your machine, you'd need um, a dozen or more GPUs, uh, graphics cards running. It's like buying 10 gamer setups uh, wow. for context, um, like pretty good gaming rigs in order to run just like just to host the model. Um, so it's the scale and with that scale you have more neurons it's like basically having a larger brain mm. uh, and gpt3 was one of the first models to really go into this territory of pushing you know does just scaling this up does giving it more neurons and more connections make it smarter and we saw yes uh we're seeing something that we're calling the scaling rule or the scaling law uh, that says the performance of the model generally scales with the uh, size of the model. This is not always true. I think stable diffusion is a great counter example of a surprisingly small model, despite the performance. But with models like GPT-3, um, scaling has certainly been the North Star, star. Scaling being the quantity of neurons in the network. Mm. And so you mentioned that yeah. you know you might need the equivalent of like 10 gamer PC setups. Yes. But with Banana, you guys are abstracting that away? Yes, uh, we, we currently don't have uh, capacity to host something GPT-3 size. That's it's pretty massive. Right. Um, but we want to get there. Uh, okay. We will essentially rent you those 10 gamer setups on a per millisecond basis to run something like GPT-3 uh, when and where you need it uh, and then not pay for it otherwise. So that's the, that's our entire value prop. We currently work for smaller models like a stable diffusion, smaller, like less than 16 gigabytes. Yeah. Um, but we want to get to GPT-3 size. So OpenAI has a bunch of different products. Yeah. They have Dolly, right? They yep. have GPT-3. Yep. A few days ago, they launched Whisper. Yes. We were talking about Unreal Speech earlier and like, mm -hmm. you know, speech to text. So from my very limited research um, on Whisper, yep. from what it looks like is it can understand your voice in a way that none of the previous models have been able to and almost even better than humans. Mm -hmm. What now becomes possible with that like, technological advancement that wasn't possible before i guess before i answer your question i as you're asking the question i was thinking through like oh whisper is probably going to listen to our voices at some point in the future we're putting it out into the internet right now um i didn't think of that that's weird yeah 
Um, so back to your question. Sorry, <laughs> I, I like got sidetracked there. That's um, strange. And anything that's available on the internet is as long as you don't have like copyright behind it, it's probably going to be used to train some model. In fact, there's tools to see, you know, have I been trained? I think have I been trained.com. But how um, does even a copyright stop that? Um, sometimes it doesn't with right? stable that's diffusion. A, yeah. Sometimes you see watermarks show up in the generation because that's <laughs> like what the model is used to seeing. Interesting. Huh? Um, I don't know if that's specifically stable diffusion, but I know these image generation models, yeah. sometimes you start seeing watermarks and you're like, Oh, this was not well, that, <laughs> lawfully taken. How, how do you see that playing out long term? Oh, it's going to be so hard to enforce. Yeah. Um, there, I, I'm not knowledgeable about it, but there is some uh, research into, how to essentially put like a digital watermark on data mm. to see if um, like if something is generated. I mean, great example is like in these image generations, you started seeing the watermark be generated because the models used to seeing this particular watermark in yeah. an image. Um, so you could do something similar where if you have a um, like a pattern in the pixels of the images you create that you could you know verifiably test and say like this image is mine mm. if you see that pattern start showing up in you know generative images you could start saying like oh I, i've caught the signature i've caught the watermark it's more of like a digital watermark though um i i can't see that being extremely enforceable yeah uh i think even at we saw in crypto like crypto popped off so quickly as a technology um, and the, the control behind it, uh, like the, the enforcement, uh, financial policies and such lagged because it was just such a new technology and new space to keep up with. So mm -hmm. I imagine that's going to be the case with ML. Um, though I have found thankfully that the ML community is generally, uh, very focused on ethics, yeah. you know, especially around ML safety and, um, the idea of keeping AIs from running away from us. Um, and a lot of open source um, influence as well that people are like sharing their data sets and these sort of things mm. that hopefully it doesn't become a huge problem. Um, if it does, it'll likely be sort of a sketchier closed source uh, ML provider. Yeah. Uh, who just like wants to turn a dollar, but I don't think the community would really hold up to that. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. But to your question before about the use cases of whisper, yeah. if you're still interested. Yes. Oh, so you like robocalls? Hate them. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, those were probably... Actually, no, case. I love them. Um, yeah. It's listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come after me, please. Yeah. yeah. That's I mean, th th that'd be a pretty basic example. Um, on a more like advanced example of these sort of things becoming common, we use keyboards to communicate with our computers previously because that's all we had. Mm-hmm as voice to text or you know voice to essentially any uh, semantic meaning uh conversion becomes possible through models like whisper that's keyboards stop becoming the interfaces you don't need you know a mouse and a keyboard anymore in order to interact with your technology and granted this has always been like not always been the case but recently the case with you know smart home speakers alexas things like that um, and people are starting to integrate those into their lives and sometimes even form emotional connections with the things. Um, with their Alexas? Yeah. You're yeah. talking about like her, the movie? Sort of, yeah. yeah. Um, small children. I have, a, I have a friend who runs a uh, educational tech startup that the interface is through the Alexa. Um, and oftentimes the, uh, the kids get like really into the Alexa. Wait, what, what do you mean? Oh, just like they talk about it as if it's a person. Oh, like, like it's a teacher, in yeah. a sense. Yeah, right? yeah. To yeah, them, yeah, like yeah. they they almost personify it as, um, as like a, you know, a knowledgeable mm. authority figure. And okay, that's interesting. I was having this conversation with, uh, with my co-founder for the startup I'm working on. He mm -hmm. has no Alexas or no Google Homes, nothing in his house, right? And so he mentioned this thing of like, the, you know the the meme of like the graph where it goes up and goes down. Yeah. So like the bell curve meme, the bell curve meme, yeah, right? I love bell curve meme. <laughs> so it's Favorite like meme. at the bottom on the left, it's people who don't understand text. So they don't want to have an Alexa or a Google yeah. you know, assistant. Yeah. At the top, it's um, people who like tech enough to have a Google assistant or an Alexa. And at the bottom, it's people who really mm -hmm. understand text. So they want nothing to do with Alexas or mm -hmm. Google assistants. Mm -hmm. So now do you see a problem with you know, now we have all of this data that's on the internet, right? Because yep. Alexa Assistant, they'll all like they'll yep. all log our 
information, our queries, whatever. Mm -hmm. Can companies now do something that they weren't able to do before with that data? Yet to be known. Um, I believe that the the capabilities of this technology doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, like it's been slowly ramping up. Alexa has had an onboard uh, speech to text interpreter for quite a while now. Mm. Um, and it may not be at the scale of whisper, uh, but as, as these models get better and better, I imagine norms start creeping into place for these sort of things, even before we've hit the, like, holy crap, uh, this is an amazing model moment. Um, so I think the question would be not correctly answered by me, seeing as I haven't worked like on the Amazon team or on the Alexa team. Um, but I, I'd be curious what they are doing with it. Uh, I personally am not much of a, uh, I don't, I tend to not worry about these sort of things, but I do think the concerns are valid for those who are tighter about their own privacy. Gotcha. F from what I understand, yeah. it's, it's mainly used in their purpose for analyzing purchasing behavior yeah. and recommending products. Yeah. Right? Interesting. So I think that's, I think that's the main purpose of like, oh, it's always listening. Yeah. Like, I don't think, again, it could be wrong. I don't think it's malicious. I think it's more in terms of like, mm -hmm. can it better suit what to target yeah. you with? But you could, I mean, if... if yeah. That's my own personal spin. Yeah. Um, in fact, like, I love leaving cookies on, on my machine. Like, I, I let co companies track me wherever they want to track because I'd rather be getting... You know, personalized recommend. If I'm getting recommendations, I'm, I'm the same way. I'd rather have them be personalized. I, I agree um, with you 100. percent And like, if someone wanted to be malicious, they could find my information anyway. It, it, a guy. I, th this was I was first house I moved into in college. Um, okay. In college, right? So it's 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 a house. It has a you know a mm -hmm. bunch of doors, whatever. The the maintenance guys, you know, fixing it up and just showing us around. Yep. And I'm like, okay, that door, like, oh, this lock doesn't work on the side door. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he's like, he's like, hey man, if they want to get in, they're gonna find a way to get in. <laughs> and we were just like, wait, <laughs> don't what? take this as privacy advice <laughs> yeah. for for your own home security. But though. I was like, I Locking mean, I I guess he's, I mean, like, and, and it was like the second lock. It wasn't like the, like you can't open that door, but it was yeah. like the screen lock. Mm -hmm. So it was like, in in essence, he's he's kind of right in in terms of like if if you're in a burglary situation. Mm -hmm. And like they're, they're gonna they're gonna break the window. You can lock the door. Like they're gonna find a way to get in, right? It's like how much do you really want to preempt? Yeah, I don't. This one, I think I'm losing my own train of thought here. I, I'm with you on this one personally. Okay, there we go. Also, not security advice, as you said. Yeah. That, that's <laughs> the important part. That, that's the really important part. <laughs> Maybe it's like a move fast and break things mentality um, mm. that I personally have, but I think it's better to be prepared for anything to happen yeah. uh, rather than try to safeguard yourself from anything from happening. Cause your point was like, they're going to get it anyway. Yeah. Right. If, if they really wanted it, yeah. like you saying no or disabling mm -hmm. the cookies is not going to stop it. Yeah. My thing is like, you want to like, like you don't want to, okay, let's just, it's yeah. like tie your camel, right? Like if you have a camel, yep. you're not going to just leave it out and just be like, I hope it doesn't wander anywhere. You're going to put the knot on and tie it against a pole. Right. So it's like, yeah, but if it you gets out of that, magic. but if it gets if, out of that, then then, then that's fine. Or, or but at least you, you tried. It's not like you just left it there to like run off. Like no, at but, least, but, but I do think that, that's do the steps point. and then you know, like do the steps, lock your door. But that's our point. Yeah. Like you, you don't need a you don't need a second lock to yeah, unlock. Yeah, we, we don't have like a chain that we're adding to yeah. the camel to keep it there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just I don't know. I, the, the whole idea of like just like being okay with like you know uh your door is not locking that part doesn't fully sit with me although yeah. in my freshman year like in my freshman year of college i i never locked my uh mm -hmm. like my apartment door when i left and my roommate hated me for it uh my whole thing was like it's like five doors to get to that door at that point so it's like yeah you know it's whatever i hate lock are you a door locker yeah oh totally okay i mean living in san francisco you got to yeah. be <laughs> yeah yeah cuz i, I was going to say I, I i'm also like you i i, I won't lock shit unless oh, yeah? i have to Oh God! I'll just oh. forget. That's what. Well, luckily I don't have a car, so no. I don't know how. Yeah. Anyways, can you send me your address later? I need, <laughs> yeah. I need to add that on a contract for you. Or some. some well, which that. specific door is it? That'd yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us know. Yeah. Oh, have a gift for you. This episode was brought to you by Highlight. Highlight makes it easy for startups to understand and debug customer issues with session replay, error stack tracing, and user console visibility. Highlight removes the mystery of debugging for your dev team. Unlike other tools in the market. Highlight makes it possible to self-serve user feedback by saving recordings of every user session in your app. 
This helps teams better understand user experience and user frustrations without having to do unnecessary user interviews. Sign up today for free at highlight.io. Do you use, well, of course you do, but uh, when was the last time you kind of went through your Twitter, your own Twitter? Oh, gosh. I assume you're asking this because you went through my Twitter. I no, I did nothing I of the did. sort. <laughs> I went through. Your he, he went yeah, through your yeah. Twitter. Um, I mean, I'll occasionally do an audit. Like I'll I'll run through it and be like, "Am I still proud of everything that's here?" Otherwise, yeah, you, know, we'll you have to... a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, a I... lot of a lot of relevant info to the to the dev community. Yeah, and just even you know what's cool about his Twitter that I would say more founders should probably be doing is complimenting his own employees. He does that a oh, lot. Yeah. You do do that a lot. So if 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 your employees are going to yeah. listen to this, uh, I'll just say, and they don't follow your Twitter, they probably should because you've given s- someone a compliment there if they've done good work uh, mm-hmm. from, from what I've read. I mean, I'm just lucky to work with incredible people. Uh, and if you're an incredible person, come work with us. He's um, ruthless with his recruiting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's his everything, recruiting. Everything yeah. is an opportunity. He's never going to have to pay for a recruiting department. Never. Oh, no, never. No. Never. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I enjoy Twitter. I, I think I enjoy it too much. Uh, I find it a bit almost a stress response of like, oh, I need to escape work. I'm already like in the address bar typing like TW enter yeah. and that's enough to get me to Twitter. Yeah. Um, so uh, but I've also found it like I, you know, despite what it may seem during this podcast, I tend to actually be pretty introverted mm. and um, I very much prefer being able to speak into the void and not have like the obligation to reply to someone. Yes. Uh, because like it takes a lot of energy to be this cool, you know? Um, so <laughs> it's true. like Twitter, I could just like just shoot my thoughts out into the world. That's all pretty genuine. I try not to filter as much as I can um, and try to, I guess, stand for the more common person or at least the common tech person out there. Mm. Would um, you consider yourself an introvert then like normally? Um, I'd say so. Yeah. Where I, did you? Like, I have sorry. a very good switch, like yeah. social switch. Where did you mm. learn how to actually talk? On like a like on a podcast in a setting where like you know you're supposed to be talking, I think I just learned it by being so not cool growing up. Like I felt that. Yeah. <laughs> I really felt that. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you're never the coolest person in the room growing up, uh, you start wanting to be that, mm. or at least I did. Yeah, uh, and I got basically frustrated with that, and I have uh, intentional stories I've put into learning how to speak in front of people and appear more confident. You ever mm. watch the YouTube channel Charisma on Command? Uh, yeah, I, I, I fell into that trap for a bit. Same. I was like 14, 15, yeah. went to an online school, and I was like, oh, okay. That's How does Robert Downey Jr. actually appear so confident? That yeah. looks like a good video. Oh, I'm going to watch that. Like the videos, I, I they, they'd analyze, like, oh, yeah. what, what did they analyze the body it's like, language? okay, he moved his fingers, therefore he is in control. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll notice, notice, like, if I'm crossing my arms in a conversation, I'm like, oh, can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my palms must be facing yeah. my opponent. I'll consciously point my toes in the right direction. It's yeah. you, you fall te- too deep into it, and you lose a lot of the genuine nature of it, unfortunately. Mm. So I have gotten away from the charisma on command stuff. Um but mainly it was just like rejection therapy was my biggest thing was like figuring out that I'm not going to die if I have like an embarrassing social situation and intentionally putting myself in embarrassing situations in order to just get used to that feeling. I did that about six years ago and I think that was a pretty significant improvement for me. Interesting. There's this guy on, I don't know what platform he's on, but I've gotten sent his videos. He'll just like go into the mall and stand on a table and just start saying stuff like loudly to quote unquote, become uncomfortable in like public yeah. places. Yeah. Some of his videos just seem like being a public nuisance, but like there, there is like a real kind of like thought process yeah. behind what he's doing. We, we oh, do yeah. not recommend or condone going to a public place, standing up. On and, a table. And on a table and just shouting. Well, I, so I just want to put a disclaimer out there. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll also <laughs> disclaim it, though I will say uh, part of my rejection therapy was very similar to that sort of stuff. I think my worst one was... Uh, I mean, I, I tried not to be a nuisance, but like I'd walk up to strangers' houses and like ask to hammock in their backyard. And like in retrospect, <laughs> wait, wait, they were what? super uncomfortable. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So say, say that again? I, so I, I did a rejection challenge. Uh, every week I would go out and intentionally get rejected over something just insane. Um, wait, wait, wait. But so you'd go to a stranger's place and ask for a hammock? I, I, I like showed up to a stranger's house with my own hammock oh. in my hand. I'm like... And I'm like, hey, you have nice trees. Could I uh, set this up? In oh, your I, I, I get it. Okay. Okay. You get it? Yeah. 
I, I get what he's saying. Okay, okay. That's not, yeah. I, 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 it's, it's not normal behavior. No, but I, I get it in terms of when he said rejection therapy. Yeah. I see that. Like, that's not the most, yeah, that's like, that's crazy, but it's, at least it's like a normal conversation in terms of like, they'll just be like, no, or whatever yeah. they say. Like, it's not, like what I thought he said was he saw a hammock <laughs> and he was like, hey, hey I saw you out of hammock. Like, I'd <laughs> love know, to, yeah. Sense. I would love to have that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, my, my- Or do you mind if I spend, yeah. I'll be only 20 minutes. Yeah. And just, 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 yeah. See, my thing was just like, I'd go stand outside Safeway and sell, like sell Boy Scout popcorn. Oh, yeah. And and honestly, like you learn, you really learn how to sell from doing that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that that that's good practice. Girl Scouts have it easy though. Like those cookies actually taste good. Popcorn. So good. Wait, wait, Girl like Scouts cardboard. Oh, that's what they made you guys sell. We had to sell popcorn, yeah. and it was the worst tasting what? popcorn. So they didn't let you sell cookies? Nah. No. Nah. <laughs> that's so bad. Yeah, it's yeah. very sad. Oh. Yeah. Wasn't. Yeah. Is that a life lesson? And this is why we're tech nerds. Like. <laughs> We're Boy Scout popcorn. Easy socialization through selling Samoas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so see, Samoas, the, the product sells itself. That's what time. I was gonna say. Yeah, they're not really doing much there. No, for us it was just a bunch of like fourteen-year-olds in uniforms that were too big for us. Yeah. Um, trying to be Go like, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, pop, pop popcorn, Boy yeah. Scouts. It was yeah. such oh, bad popcorn really too. You. You, so you did, oh, so you, you did also Boy Scouts too. Yeah. You get to oh, Eagle? Really I did you. not. No. 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 Uh, I dropped out of heart. At heart. Yeah. What's heart? The the literally the step before Eagle. Ah, I got to the Eagle project. I'm like, nah, I just want to go like play with Legos or something. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well let's let, let, let's get to something somewhat related to that. Okay. In terms so we had a few questions come in from from, from Twitter. Mm. So one one pretty general one. So would love to know more about the long distance training plus building a company. What does balancing that look like? So I guess Again, for, for a little bit more context, you're, you're very into long distance running. Yeah, right? I, I run ultra so can you can you go more into that and then probably to sum that up kind of how it's balancing, but also how it impacts the way you even you yeah. even think about startups and, and your own personal uh, development? Well, I'm, I'm a founder in the first place because of running. I uh, got about halfway through undergrad uh, just being generally fat, sad and antisocial. Or like not not cool, um, and I eventually just got frustrated being that, and I decided to change things. So I went couch to marathon over the span of a summer, and completely redefined my own definitions of what's possible. Because previously, like marathon was just one of those absurd, like oh nobody does that sort of goals, mm. um, and that's what sort of started the spark for me in like my entire life. That was the most important decision I ever made. Was Can you explain that? Marathon. A little bit in terms of like, let's say, like how many months, any weight loss, like any specific uh, like you numbers you remember? Or, yeah, I got rejected by a girl, and I felt sad. I, was, I remember I was at a Szechuan hot pot with my friends, and they're like, "Eric, you're being sad. Like, what, what, what's going on? Uh, you, you could do better." And I like took that to heart. I'm like, "Yeah, I could do better." Wow. Saw so one yes theory video. He was like, "That's gonna be me." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I over the span of it, it was probably four months of like intense training i ended up losing 60 pounds wow amazing. um and ramped up like max i had ever did done before in terms of running distance was about five miles mm -hmm. uh, so i got that up to a full marathon what um, what is a full marathon by the way 26 oh. miles 26 miles yeah wait, wait wait so in four months you went from five miles to 26 yeah it's it sucks is that healthy um i'd say so yeah. i i was right on the edge of like what would be unhealthy it was only because I think only because I had like decent leg muscles from carrying my fat body around. Okay. That like when I lost the weight, it was suddenly like super easy to run. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, wait. So that's interesting. So I like I go to the gym and I lift, yeah. right? Yeah. No cardio. Yeah. So, but one of the things is my my roommate, him and one of our friends wake up at like six thirty a.m. every morning, mm -hmm. most mornings, yeah. <laughs> and they go running right around campus. Yep. So how if I now want to like let's just say we were talking about this earlier. Just the idea of, of an Iron Man. Iron Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I want to get, actually get into running, what would you say I should do first? Um, well, firstly, I want to support the audacious goal of an Iron Man. It is 100% doable, um, given that you're uh, physically able. So uh, how would you start? Find, well, find a training buddy or someone who's done it before that can make it seem trivial. Hmm. That's the most important thing is just meeting people who are like, so for context, I've done a half Ironman okay. as well. Uh, so like I, I've been in that community. Um, and for me, one of the most shocking thing I did 
when I was around that community is I'd be talking to people at those races at triathlons and, you know, talking about like, oh yeah, I'm training for half Ironman coming up. And they're like, cool, when's your full Ironman going to be? And they ask when rather than do you plan on doing one? Mm. And like, like just, natural. yeah, it just, um, the, the way in which they talk about it, things seem inevitable. Interesting. And you need to be in that mindset. You need to be around people that aren't like, you already run a half marathon. That's insane. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, you gotta be around people like, yeah, I mean, I've done a, done a few marathons before they're fun. Mm-hmm. And then like, that's the extent of the conversation. You meet a few people like that and suddenly it's easier to keep running when you're out there and you think it sucks, but you're like, you know, this is normal to keep running. I'm not insane to go after mile 10 or whatever. Interesting. I mean, that similar like framework or like mental framework exists even in the founder community. I never realized that. Yep. Yeah. Like and if you're, hmm, if you're sitting around mission. people that raise like five, $10 million in, in like for nothing, right? Exactly. Like, I mean, it, it feels all, very doable. It's all about just like subtle suggestions to raise your bar. Mm. And then can you, can you get back into, so, okay, so four months got into, you know, marathon shape. Yep. Now, where does the startup journey kind of start? Uh, almost immediately after that. In fact, that's it was during a summer. Uh, that summer, I started my first startup, which was a vertical farming startup. Oh, um, not a social app? No, no, I didn't do that. By the um, way, there, there's going to be a tweet he tweets about social apps. Exciting. And, and it's kind of, I, I guess, targeting you when you made your social app. So I was, was going to bring that up anyway. Oh, but yeah. did you dig up an old Oh, yeah. Mine? Yeah, oh, yeah. We, we got good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, baby. Let's do this. Um, so vertical farming, keep in mind, I came from a very agricultural background, was supposed to be a farmer growing up. Um, my school did not have tech uh, or the people in computer science were generally shut ins and it wasn't like the big, yeah. the big thing of the school. Mm-hmm. Um, so like for me, entrepreneurship or like tech startup was just like whatever you saw SoftBank funding and like the occasional headlines, yeah. you're like, this is the future. So I saw vertical farming and I'm like, well, clearly I'm going to be a billionaire doing this. <laughs> um, so my friends and I, in fact, my, my running training buddy, um, just like bought some bins and started like growing, what was it? Uh, I think it was peas. We just started growing peas in his basement and it didn't go anywhere. We very quickly forgot about the peas and they died. Um, but like that was the, is that, is that so vertical <laughs> farming is just, what, what is that exactly? Okay. Vertical farming is the idea that, um, in outdoor farming, you just have one plane, you have the ground and that's what. The plants grow in. Yeah. Um, but the idea is you have so much room above them to also grow plants. So in urban environments where you can't get acres and acres of land, what if you just like had shelving units with plants growing on them with LEDs, good ventilation, a watering mm. system? Uh, so you could cover like a full farm's worth of square footage yeah. in an apartment. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So that was the concept. Uh, I know some people around... Uh, I think are very pro vertical farming. After my stint there, I spent about a year and a half doing that and ended up uh, studying abroad in Singapore in order to like meet a bunch of the vertical farmers o- over there. Um, oh, so you really got into it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we, we, we let the peas die, but like I still cared about the tech <laughs> okay. uh, and I thought it was a cool future. And um, so <laughs> let the peas die, but he yeah. still cared about the tech. I, I let the peas die, man. <laughs> when did you like, when did you decide to give up on the idea? I, Basically, I, I like I, I fell into a very early founder trap of thinking when you have an idea, you keep it secret, you patent it, so, mm. you tell everyone about it, but just enough where they can't steal your IP, and then like once you finally get that patent, you're just like instant millionaire. Yeah. Um, so I spent the first like year of this startup uh, going to pitch competitions, like um, telling everyone about like my great idea, and it was um, a mechanical like solution in order to pack plants a lot more tightly i got like oh you could get 60 percent more plants in the same volumetric space without any reduction in quality like growth yeah. conditions um and i thought i was a genius uh but i like i didn't build it mm. i didn't tell anyone about it i just told them i had the idea okay and that was the extent of it ah, um it. so i actually ended up blowing a decent amount of money like talking to a patent lawyer to like get this done yeah Ouch. yeah um but the I forget what what was the the question that brought us here. You were talking about how you went from an uh, from running for four months. Yeah, that was your first idea into oh, a yeah. startup, and then kind of then how you got to 
I yeah. guess, well, whatever came next and then oh, banana yeah. dev when that comes in. Yes. So I was, I was hustling the vertical of farming thing for a while through that. I got into like, you know, writing the automation for the prototype itself. I finally started building the thing after yeah. years of being quiet. And then after you ran through a bunch of money, you decided it was time to like call it quits. Yeah, it was time to move on okay. um, or move on to the next flashy thing, which is bioinformatics. Because I'm like, you know, why, why have a vertical farm when you're not also taking DNA samples of wow. every plant? Um, and yeah. still no social app. Yeah, no social app. <laughs> yeah, I, Surprising. I, I, was, I was running machine learning on DNA sequences before well, let's inventing just, a let's just read. App. Let's just read the one he had. Oh, gosh, okay? let's hear it. So, so this is the tweet. Number one, death. Number two, taxes. Number three, endless monthly pattern of invite-only social apps capitalizing mm -hmm. on high school. You can't sit with us. FOMO marketing. Now, Sounds Omar, right. is that what you did when you did your social app? Sounds about right. <laughs> no. Invite-only page. Oh, no, you can't get the test flight. Sorry, uh, it's in uh, private beta. Yeah. There was no test flight. Everyone on Twitter is posting about it, but I can't get in, and I felt bad. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, none of them worked. Paparazzi did for a while. Do you know about paparazzi? Yeah, but how? Well, did they get it wasn't out? sticky? What is, what I, I don't know what happened with them. Okay, yeah. so th there you go. You're you're, you're probably mm -hmm. doing better than a lot of those. Which, when you use scarcity as a means to make your product seem better, I think you're avoiding the actual product market fit question. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I feel like scarcity actually has a, a very important part, especially in social like social apps. Like think about Clubhouse. If they had stayed, you know, scarce in who they let in, mm -hmm. the value would have just been i think i think the value would have carried over but they scaled mm -hmm. in my in my mind i feel like they scaled too fast mm -hmm. and then it just turned into me getting on clubhouse and it's just the same friends i'm on facetime with were also on the app yeah but i remember when i got on not early but like i got on once and i was in a room with mr beast like yeah, that was insane. how do you monetize so how yeah. do you monetize that i'm not talking about like the monetization of a social app but like product that, market that's the only thing lies. that matters yeah Clubhouse, you could do Clubhouse ads, would have could, never existed either way. It, it never survives because there's no way to make money if you keep it like that. Spaces survives. I still spaces still, is what? Twitter spaces. Twitter's yeah, Clubhouse. It's, it's inside of Twitter. Yeah. That's why it survives. I don't know. I still think Clubhouse could have made it work if they had stayed, like maybe it's making people pay for a subscription. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know what the monetization would have looked like, but I, I do think that there was more value before they opened it up for everyone. I, I think it's exactly what he said. If you make scarcity... I, I think his message, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you make scarcity part of the actual product utilization, it, it, it won't work. Unless you keep it scarce, but then it can't be a venture scale startup. Like if, if it had remained scarce and it was like ev everyone's private club, like people love private clubs. Those mm -hmm. are great. Is it a product though? Mm. It's certainly, yeah, like, it's like they tried product, to build, their, it, they tried to build Soul House yeah. for. For on like like the whole point of Soul House is it's physical. It's like saying I'm gonna build F Inc. in in the metaverse. Yeah. Like then okay, but we're kind of aren't we defeating the purpose of what this actually is? Yeah. I don't know. I still think there's a lot of value in online social communities. I, I'm I'm not saying there I is. Declare, I I yeah. think there's value in those. I don't think there's value in gating it. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I, I still don't know where I stand on it. I still feel like that the, the scarcity model works. I just don't know the best way to monetize it. Mm -hmm. And and again, I'm thinking about this purely from a. a like an actual user standpoint, not yeah. from monetization, okay. not from yeah, venture yeah. back. I got you. Right. Like the, the actual product itself became less useful when they opened it to everyone. I think if it was a bootstrapped company and it wasn't built on, you know, celebrities, this and founder, this, it might've had a shelf space because then you wouldn't have felt the pressure of monetizing it so quickly. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's part of the answer. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. That, yeah. I don't know. Maybe. I actually never use the platform, so I can't. I, I've it. never been on it either, so I have no idea. Yeah. I really liked it for a solid four weeks. <laughs> As did many people. As did many people. <laughs> well, here's another good yeah. one, and we, we already broached this, but he had this in, in, in Twitter. Mm -hmm. Fruit name tech brands in order of importance. He had banana first, yeah. obviously. Obviously. Apple. And then, I don't know, this is kind of insulting. You put like seven dots, and then you put BlackBerry. Yeah. Insulting. I mean, you could have just put BlackBerry third. But you put them like eighth, and then yeah. you just left the spaces. To be clear, I respect the person in the arena. So um, if 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 BlackBerry went out and did what they did, I think they did great. Um, you know, many people below them didn't make that list. <laughs> <laughs> Who's below them? I don't know. Hair uh, <laughs> from iCarly. Oh, oh, Parif Parif oh. oh. Th that, that was also an ant farm, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah, it was. What? Huh. Yeah, what parafones were an ant farm. What is ant farm? What is this? Oh, okay. yeah. 
Old people. Old people? Old people, man. I'll be honest. I actually pretended to know what it was for, uh, like, to signal social confidence. <laughs> This is how you become cool, guys. Yeah. Just signal you know stuff. Yeah, yeah. I was uncool so much learning here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just another like. What, what is what I, is that farm? It was either it was Disney or Nickelodeon. Just another show about yeah. like these like smart kids who go to like a private, not not like a boarding school for gifted kids. I, I don't remember much of it. I just remember seeing pair phones and trying to go buy one on Amazon. Yeah, because I didn't know it wasn't. A, I was like twelve. Ago. I was, yeah. Like nine. Um, okay, that's fair. Oh. Well, another good one. I mean, this goes back to what you're saying about Mexico City, but Ooh. I think this is about SF. But he says, four tacos just cost me 40 bucks. F this place. That'd buy me 89 tacos at my favorite stand in Mexico City. I think I actually did the math on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 89 is a very specific number. Tacos yeah. are really expensive here yeah. for like what, what they that actually was, are. so sad. It was my first return to San Francisco after more than a year in Mexico City. You know, eating my, yeah. you know just a few cent tacos, uh, came up here to like a bougie place. They didn't even advertise the price. I just get the bill and it's yeah. you know, more than $40 for a couple of tacos. So Taste wise. How is it? Bad. Horrible. Yeah. Not- Horrible, right? <laughs> yeah. No, you pay uh, for well, the experience. A uh, few things to clarify. I love California Mexican food. It's not like Mexico city, Mexican food or, yeah. you know, my, my, what, what, what is, what is, you can answer this. What is California Mexican food? Uh, I mean, a flour tortilla for starters, okay. uh, Anything burrito, like the idea of yeah, like okay. sh- shove the beans and the meat and it's got to be huge. Yeah. Um, and once you start adding like, um, you know, guacamole or, or uh, even like, f- like if you get weird and start adding French fries, that's like well into California. Okay. Uh, I, the French fries, I know that yeah. that's the California burrito stuff. Yeah. I was just at this place this morning uh, in Oakland with my friend, the same friend who uh, went to Canara that I brought on the episode. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> same yeah. Uh, we went to this place called Maya's yeah. in Oakland. Yeah. And they were there was guac in his in his burrito. Mm-hmm. Really good burrito though. You guys to be clear, I love it. I love it so much. Yeah. When I tell my uh, authentic Mexican girlfriend that I love California burritos, she's like, "No, that's not real. That's not real Mexican food. Yeah, it's great food, uh, but it's 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 in a different class entirely." What's your go to uh, taco order? Al Pastor. Al Pastor. Al Pastor. Okay. Thinly sliced corn tortilla, a little flick of the pineapple from the top of the spit. It's perfect. Yeah, we got we got to go down to Mexico yeah, City. I know, I know the place. Let's do it. Come down. We got to do that. Okay, so here here we go. We're gonna get to our startup idea. Let's do it. Okay, so th- th- this is your idea to start. Okay, so this is what you tweeted: idea, robotic toilet paper holder that flips over mm. whenever someone loads it with the roll feeding backward. What what's that? Explain that. Okay, toilet paper. Is this is this empty? Here, I'll, Mostly. I'll, I need to take the sleeve from it. I can't. I'll demo with this water bottle. Okay, oh, yeah. look at you. <laughs> nice and strong. All right. So you got the toilet paper roll, right? Yeah. Here's the wall. Here's the mount. Okay. You're, you're sitting on the toilet yeah. trying to have a good time, but your good time is ruined because whoever was here previously set the toilet paper so it rolls backwards and comes out the backside from okay. underneath. Yeah. Rather than a nice convenient over the top where you could just give it a little slap, it does a little couple rolls, and that's <laughs> the exact length you need. Now, can I have we, hard opinions on this. Whisper is listening to this right now. Yeah. Whisper is going to know the correct way to roll toilet paper thanks to this. But why do we... Okay, so, so we, have, we have bidets, right? And that's, that's popular in Europe. Yeah, right? I also want to clarify, those are incredible. The, the, this toilet paper argument becomes irrelevant once you the, have here, here's Because okay. they're so good. So here's my thing. We talk so AIML. Yeah. Okay, all this fun stuff. Now, h- how do we optimize the toilet experience using AI? And ML because, okay, so you're getting finding the correct target would be (laughs) because you're saying toilet robotic holder. Yeah. Is there more innovation here? Because like, well, one can, uh, this, this is real. I don't like sitting on cold, cold toilet seats. Yeah. Right. Who does? Yeah. But it's like, is there toilet paper innovation here? But can we also train AI to help us in this experience. Mm-hmm. But then what's what's the slippery slope? How dangerous can this get? Well, like I said before. Your thoughts. Yes. The- yes, please. I, I don't want any thoughts on this from, from me going into the internet where Whisper can hear it. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, as I said before, the tools become power. It's like a, a baby with superpowers. The tools are powerful, but occasionally they screw up. Um, and toilet paper is not something I want to work 95% of the time. <laughs> yeah. It's something I want to work 100% of the time, even if it's lower tech. So 
I this would be one of the few areas where I'm a bit more like, you know, I'll, I'll keep my traditional toilet paper. If innovation were to come in, though. Yeah, what what would that look like? Um, I mean, something that predicts when it's about to run out based off of my normal usage. So mm. it throttles me. Because you, you ever you ever do that thing, not to like get too into details, but... No, please do. Uh, ever do into that thing, like may, maybe your normal, your normal usage is like, I'm starting with seven squares. That's my luxury strip that I'll, that I'll start. Seven squares? I, I'm using it so I can work <laughs> down to ultimately okay. six, five, four. By the time, like... As the roll looks like it's getting empty, you're like, oh, no, and you need to start really budgeting. Can the roll automatically dispense, like, the median length that you'll need in order to successfully finish? Oh, the so it's training. So basically yeah. it's picking up the, the average usage. Exactly. I think there's innovation to be had there. And then, like, if you have roommates or whatever, like, one person can skew yeah. the data. Yeah. Or, like, a cat comes along and... Pff, just it. destroys the data. <laughs> but can we do more? I feel like we're not doing enough. Famous last words. For the experience, <laughs> like the whole experience. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm a bidet maximalist. So um, I think if there's, if there's effort to put in the experience, it'd be making bidets that much better. How would you make it better? I wouldn't. I would just make it like on every toilet that ever existed. Well, wh- why better. don't we use it here in America? Uh, is it because the toilet paper industry just has... I think there was actually... So this is total speculation, um, but I've heard rumors about like there was a paper lobby because um, actually I I worked at a paper company for what, one of my internships you early did. on. Yeah, in Wisconsin, it's a big paper manufacturing. It's like area. some Dunder Mifflin. Yeah, stuff. <laughs> um, and I heard rumors about uh, like there was a lot of lobbying that went on initially uh, to make it so that you know people adopted toilet paper. Mm. Um, and used more and more of it, like the Charmin Bear, for example. Yeah, yeah. You see how happy it is. Yeah, when it uses that toilet paper. Don't you want to be happy too? Things oh, like that. I, okay, I, I get it. Yeah. So, so you're, you're thinking about it more from a marketing branding yeah. standpoint. Yeah, there's marketing. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't know what sort of like legal laws would go into place that would prevent uh, the the usage of toilet paper. I don't. Perhaps like plumbing zoning, but I'd be fully speculating at that point. Mm. Yeah. How about this? So with Johnny. Yep. We talked about showering. Yeah. But <laughs> how he specifically likes to think in the shower. I've I've seen Johnny shower actually. Yeah. Oh. Mm, okay. Okay. <laughs> Why'd you say it like that? Why'd you- <laughs> I was just excited to share that I know Johnny. So that Why'd be, you know? say it like that? We all know Johnny. He's right. <laughs> He's like, I've actually seen him. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> why and how? I was at his house and I just used his restroom. But w- while he was showering? No, I've seen his shower. I oh, I thought you said I heard him. I've, seen, I've him seen him shower. If we go back to the audio, I'm pretty sure you said whisper, seen him shower. Whisper heard you yeah. say that you watched him shower. We'll use AI to prove this one. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no, no, I've seen an empty shower. With oh, it. Does that it have the, the notes all across? Oh, it does. So yeah. you've seen that? Yeah, it's a it's a waterproof notepad that's just hanging in his shower. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, if it, so you haven't used his shower. A shower or his shower? No, <laughs> I, I, I would really, really, really hope you've used a shower. I did not use the shower, but I did okay. leave a note. I, drew, I was curious I if you left a, little a note. Banana That's right. on the note for him. <laughs> okay, but going going off that, you know how they always say, like you get your best thoughts in weird places. Yeah, right. So his his was shower. I I said toilet. I yeah. think that's common. Omar didn't agree. I go on. I go on walks. I, yeah. And you're you're a runner, so I, I guess was gonna say that. Yeah, like how do you is is running therapeutic for you? Do, do do you think of ideas there? Like how do you? A lot of people complain about okay, they need to listen to music or yeah. or how do you hold your attention while running that long? Like, can you explain that process? Yeah, um, running is very much meditation for me. Uh, both the breathing, like I try to keep a very regular breathing cadence to yeah, you know, keep sane and avoid cramping. So through regular breathing, I'll listen to music. Maybe half the time. Okay. Um, I find that on longer distance, I become so exhausted that my mind just kind of turns to goo. Mm. And I can't form coherent thoughts. But you keep running. Yeah, I keep running. Is that flow state? Like people I, always I talk about it, flow state. I consider it flow. Flow or more so just like a pure emotional experience. Uh, I, Whenever I run more than an hour, almost inevitably during that run, I'm probably crying at some point. C- continuously. 
So you're saying with no breaks, you're yeah. just running? Yeah, just continuously. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, my average run will be two hours or more. And at what, what, what point would you consider it flow state? Um, at least an hour in. Okay. Um, my, my, I'm just like so blank. I'm not thinking about anything. I'm usually just observing like, oh, it's so beautiful out. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, wow. Or like feeling those emotions because my mind's not functioning enough to actually think those thoughts. Do you like crash after? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so that's like at the end of, the, uh, end of your day? Uh, I try to do it. I mean, it usually just takes up a whole weekend today. Um, so I'll okay. go out on like a Saturday or Sunday, uh, do my long run, come back, like eat some food. I always get a coffee after like a nice iced latte is my treat. Okay. Um, and then I just crash for like two hours, take a nap mm. and then I'm back at it. And do you use like, do you use whoop, the data trackers, any, and I know no. you, you wanted, we looked something up right on running, but it was a startup that we wanted to ask. All right. Strava? I forget. I said Strava. It's the running social app. Yeah. Yeah. Strava. Step in. Step in. Step, step in. in. Yeah. But uh, it's like, do you know yeah. about step in? I don't actually. So from what I've understood, it's like run to earn crypto. Oh, that's um, fun. yeah. Yeah. They, from their landing page, and I've heard a lot about them. They seem pretty big. Basically, it's like you run, you go to new locations, you get crypto for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess if you haven't heard about it, then yeah. won't yeah. be too many thoughts on but it. But as like a runner, I mean, obviously you're a runner, but you're a tech guy. Like, do you find use in these in these wearable tech tools? And do you think as we go farther, even AI, ML, like would you see yourself not only even maybe creating a startup mm -hmm. that benefits runners but also you know something you'd like to use that is not available oh so many mixed emotions on this um some of my best running seasons of my life have been when i hired a trainer okay um to like look in my form understand exactly what i'm doing suggest shoes things like that uh same goes for going to the gym doing weight workouts uh lifting i've um i'm really interested in computer vision being able to correct form because I think it's imperfection in, in form and generally flexibility that lead to injury. And injury is one of, you know, one of the biggest enemies in running is you just want to keep, keep training, keep doing it. You can yeah. avoid these injuries. Though that said, outside of basically form analysis, I personally try to avoid tech during runs. Mm. Um, I like using Strava, the social media app, uh, to track my runs so other people can give me kudos and like, you know, tell me I did good. Yeah. Um, and it also is like a benchmark for my pace. Mm. But I try to detach from tech while I run. Okay. It's like purely a um, meditative, not think about it too much. And also like to me, the the wearables aren't where they need to be yet in terms yeah. of their accuracy. Okay. Um, I imagine they could get there, but it's such a multivariate problem that for me, I prefer to just uh, trust myself and listen to my body and use that as my feedback mechanism. Mm. I, I use an aura ring, like I have it on right now. Yep. And so the thing is, it's great. So I, I, I have like periods of times where I'll sometimes have trouble sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, and so the aura ring's been great because it'll tell me how long I've been awake before I fall asleep. Yep. But one of the biggest kind of detractors from like, I'll tell my friends like, hey, you know, you should you know, consider it's pretty nice, like, especially if mm -hmm. they tell me they've had sleeping problems. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things that'll come up um, is people who have tried it before, they'll have a, you know, they'll sleep and the next morning they'll feel fine. But then the app will tell you like, you didn't get enough sleep, you're going to have mm -hmm. a bad day. And then it's just like, okay, great. Yeah. Um, and there have been some studies where it's like, you know, you'll get the app telling you when you haven't had enough sleep, the app will tell you you're doing great mm -hmm. and you'll have a good day. Yeah. But then you would have had a good sleep some days and the app tells you you didn't do so well. Yeah. And so now you just mm. feel tired the whole day. Yeah. Do you think that or how far away do you think we are from, you know, the, the tech like ML being able to actually properly detect these things? Probably within the next five years, we could have an extremely dependable sleep tracker. Interesting. Um, the this like time series pattern recognition stuff is actually one of the least innovative areas recently. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of ML, like the big ML hype isn't as focused around that sort of stuff. So I don't know if it's going to keep pace. Mm -hmm. um, but assuming seeing as uh, these, you know, extremely performant models are coming out in like text generation or uh, speech synthesis and these sort of things. Um, if you assume that this is going to apply to the other more traditional areas of machine learning, like time series, I imagine like five years, it feels like the next five years are extremely important in terms of most capabilities being, unlo being unlocked at least to a, a, mm. a near human level.
And then, you know, you mentioned computer vision. Do you know Labib in KO? I do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for... He's a great example of the sort of stuff that I really like when it comes to computer vision and fitness. Mm. Right. So he was, you know, our first episode or our first guest for the podcast. And so for people that haven't watched that episode, um, he's building KO, which is, you know, it'll use computer vision to, you know, get you ready to get into an MMA gym. Mm-hmm. Um, his whole thing is trying to build, uh, trying to create like 1 billion martial artists, mixed martial artists. Mm-hmm. So where right now, where does the tech stand when it, you know, comes to fo- like computer vision being able to tell you what your form is? Like when I go to the gym, I've definitely gotten some back injuries before. Mm-hmm. How far are we away from the, my phone being able to like accurately tell me? Your punches are off, you know, your, mm-hmm. your lap pull down is like weak. Mm. Um, it's also domain specific. It's really good for Labib to be going specifically for MMA because the the exact motions that you could be tracking um, are finite. So same would apply to a weight gym. Though this would be one of those situations similar to what I was talking about before of mixing hard-coded logic with the model itself. Uh, Because ultimately what you'd end up doing is just pose detection. Pose being like uh, figure out where the angles are, like your elbow, your shoulder, and you go off of that. So it would be like if this, if you that, angle of your elbow for example exceeds this certain um this certain threshold then you're out of the bounds of healthy that tech has been relatively uh unchanged from what i understand for like the last three ish years Mm. three to four years not knowing if anything new is coming out in the space but But don't you have to wear like sensors or something how how did the like how did connect work you know xbox connect yeah how did that work uh exactly that it did pose estimation so it would see the angles in your body uh, some of it wasn't even ML. It was just like... Like hard-coded? like Yeah, it, it would look at the the pixels in the camera and assume like, oh, if there's you know a light background then... Or a light light pickles, pixels, that's probably background. If there's like a continuous blob of what looks like a human shape in pixels, <laughs> then like that's probably a human. So find like the bends in it and assume mm. that those are elbows and knees and... It was pretty accurate too yeah. for 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 what it is. Yeah, surprisingly good. Yeah. I mean, to be clear, they did more um, like regression type work. It's more traditional machine learning rather than mm. neural networks. Gotcha. Um, and that's the sort of tech that we've been seeing around. And that's why, like, you could start building these apps from cell phones because the models are so small, um, mm. which is exciting. You could distribute it easily, but it's not having the same explosion that these like large language models, like. Uh, very very deep neural networks are having interesting and you said you could you could actually build some of these off of like the the previous models from your cell phone yes uh, as in you could host it on your cell phone i uh, remember gpt3 takes like 10 gaming rigs or mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. um something like pose estimation uh for things like fitness apps could generally bake down to the size of a cell phone and so banana and, could definitely handle those smaller oh uh, we could handle thousands of those so mm. okay and what have you seen people actually use banana for like what types of projects are they hosting uh, we're, we're we're all over the place. We we certainly have our fair share of uh, GPTJ uh, text generation, which is open source GPT three, um, and stable diffusion text image. Uh, the more flashy like flagship models that I've been mentioning. Um, though we do have a lot of people doing simple consulting gigs, um, doing like image detection on us or uh, speech synthesis or text to speech. Um, it's it's pretty all over the place. We actually have some users as well, like hacking our system to not even run machine learning and just to get to our gpus to do like rendering jobs for photoshop as an example interesting yeah yeah it's pretty cool pretty dope yeah we all out of tweets um anymore yeah there's got to be some spicy ones in there i try (sighs) i try not to delete them because i feel like that's a disservice well we we, let's do this one and then and then we can i know we're, we're we're going over let's let's just do this one because it's interesting and it's relevant to sf a conspiracy theory I've invented. Oh, I know this one. <laughs> he went, oh, <laughs> oh, this is where it ends. Yep. <laughs> is, is that the Bay Wheels bike share standard bikes in SF have intentional friction added to their gearing as a way to upsell people into the e-bikes? For those who haven't visited San Francisco, there's a bike share system with basically docks where you could grab a bike, you pay for it through an app, um, take the bike, ride it across the city. There's docks everywhere and you leave it at a free dock. Uh, when you find it, and you just pay for the duration of the ride. There are two types of bikes in these bike shares. 
there's like these beautiful electric assist bikes that take you up and down the nice rolling hills of San Francisco. Yeah. Like the city bikes? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, and there's this garbage heavy, like steel Ferris iron bikes that they <laughs> have in the system as well. Um, that just really seem so poorly engineered or likely engineered for durability. But my conspiracy theory is um, that these bikes, when you try to pedal them, you put more effort and you're sweating just to like move at a walking pace on these older yeah. non-electric assist bikes. Um, and I insist that they're intentionally bad or intentionally not maintained so that people upsell to the like three times as more three times as expensive electric assist versions. But also like, can those city bikes even get up the hills? Cause like, you know that road we take whenever we go yeah. get dinner? Oh my God. It's just straight up. Is that the one uh, here going up through Pacific Heights? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we I've can barely get up in a BMW. Yeah. Alone. So oh, yeah. can you use a city bike up that? I, I ride up them, but it's not fun. Okay. Even but but not with this one, not with the the one you're talking about. Definitely not with the yeah. heavy one. I mean, if you try to rode, even if you rode that down the hill, it's friction <laughs> would slow you, down. you wouldn't you wouldn't even coast. You would just come to a stop. <laughs> but what's your thing? So so, so it'll it, it forces you to use the other one. What, yeah. What's that makes sense? Honestly, if there is like a if they have. But the why same even have that one then in the first place? Why don't you just everyone use the other one? Because like, the other one's what? more expensive. The other one's more expensive. Oh, I get it. So yeah. it's cheaper. I'm going to use that one. And then you hate it. And ah. I'm just going to use the nice ones. Mm, interesting. Whereas if you came to the nice ones first, you'd be like, I'm just not going to ride a bike at all. Ah. Interesting. Is that is there a lesson in there? Is there yeah. a startup lesson in there? Well, in an adjacent industry, you know, they, they say the best way to build a, a, billion, a million dollar electric scooter company in 2022. How? Build a billion, uh, a billion <laughs> dollar electric scooter company in 2021 so good okay <laughs> i just really wanted to put that out there <laughs> i definitely so. stole that tweet from someone um it's just so good okay like I, bird I and lime that. yeah yeah like they're are they dead is is this over no, the electric scooter thing in berkeley they're great i mean they're they're certainly less than the valuations at which they used yeah. to raise yeah like we got spins and vo's all over berkeley and it's great oh so spins so the bird and lime aren't even around I haven't seen birds or limes in a minute. Yeah. Definitely they not were, birds. Were, li limes what? are around. Still oh, li limes Francisco. are around. Yeah. Oh, even in San Jose, like limes are pretty big, but in Berkeley, not. It's just like oh. spins and spins and VOs. They're mm. pretty good. It's a okay. super. It's a net good for society. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's really good to have them. I love them. Okay. Um, but man, I'd hate to be the investor who invested in those. Like, what was it three, four years ago? Was like the real peak of those? Because mm -hmm. they each got a few hundred million at least. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Because they were building a whole new category. But they thought it was going to be like Uber and Lyft type yeah. returns. I assume. I, I could only assume. Probably, first yes. I mean, I, I use those scooters in the bike share system to get around SF instead of uh, Uber. So, like, I could see it being mm, okay. a viable route. Yeah. You just left them wherever you... Is that Was that the problem with that? Is, like, you just leave them in, like, someone's lawn or something? Yeah. Like, Berkeley actually used? had it banned for a while yeah, um, yeah. just because people just leave them all over the place. And then now they have, like, specific parking spots where it's, like, if I don't park the VO in the right, mm -hmm. like, street or if it's not locked up against an actual bike rack, mm. I'll get, like, a $15 fine. Oh, okay. And so that's okay. been the way they're, they're that like makes trying sense. to get around it. With that the bikes, sense. they have, like, the designated lock spots or, like, the designated docking. Uh, mm. City can control that more. Okay. It's likely... It, I mean, there is an exclusivity agreement between Lyft and the city mm. on like the, Lyft is the provider of these bikes for the city. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay. So you don't have to worry about competition. Whereas the scooters, they're just trying to choke each other out. And mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Perfect okay. competition. Yeah, yeah. perfect competition. <laughs> Honestly, so I think this is, this is where we're going to cut it. You know, this was a really interesting episode. Yeah, yeah, this was awesome. Where can people find you online? Um, I'm on Twitter at, at Eric doing things. Uh, Eric with a K. And I wouldn't recommend finding me on LinkedIn because it's a garbage platform. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully Whisper doesn't hear that when it's time to go do enterprise There's a sales. lot we'll they've heard on LinkedIn. Yeah. In this one. By the yeah. time we're done with this podcast, man, it's going to be. I don't be, even know if I want to sit on uh, a toilet after this one. <laughs> I don't know what. Yeah. No, definitely. But before we get back into more topics about the bathroom, <laughs> oh. thank you everyone for listening to this episode of the podcast and make sure you follow us across our platforms like this. If you're watching it on YouTube, subscribe. And we will see you next week. Peace. Woo. Thank you guys.